All right, 2 Peter chapter 1 is our opening text. This is where we've been starting, and it says this, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power, not regular power, as His divine power hath given. Everybody say, hath given. Well, that's past tense. Hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life, and godliness. Well, I mean, that's a pretty big statement. Have you ever paid attention to what that says? It says, God's power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life. Well, does money pertain to life? I mean, you work for it every day, don't you? Don't it take money to pay your rent, buy clothes, feed your kids? It says he's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. What about health? Does that pertain to your life? What about peace and joy and happiness? Does that pertain to life? Yeah. Well, I mean, is that statement true or is that just somebody made it up and just put it in there? It's true, isn't it? It says, he hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, how come we don't have it? Well, because we have to learn how to reach out and tap into what's been provided. God's already done his part. He hath given he hath given all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. How do you get it? Well, you got to find out how his kingdom operates. See, see, the scripture says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. He said, my thoughts are way higher than your thoughts. So we got to find out how does God's kingdom operate how can we tap into what he's already given? The problem's not with God. The problem's with us tapping into, taking advantage of what God's already given to us. Because it says right here that it comes through everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue. Virtue means goodness. Glory means having a glorious life. Not only in this life, but in the life to come. He calls you for that. Doesn't the scripture say he's coming back for what kind of church? How many of you know the Bible? What kind of church is he coming back for? A glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He's not coming back for a bunch of people hiding in the mountains, trying to eat dried up rice and beans and trying to hold out to the end. He's coming back for a glorious church full of power, full of strength and full of ability. He's coming back for us. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. So it's going to take knowledge. Now, if you know the Old Testament, you already know what the prophet Hosea said about it. He said in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. They don't know. Now, God wants you to have the knowledge. If you're a disciple and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants you to have the knowledge. In fact, the disciples came to him and asked him about it. In Matthew chapter 13, you remember in Matthew 13 and Luke 8 and in Mark 4, it's all the same story. It's the parable of the sower. And Matthew records this. The disciples come to Jesus. Matthew 10 says, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, because of the knowledge... Now, how are you going to get what, what pertains, everything pertains to life and godliness? It's through the knowledge of him. Notice what he says here. The knowledge of the secrets. So there must be some secrets out there. Everybody say secrets. The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. So he don't want the world finding out about some of these secrets because they would pervert them and twist them and mess them up. So it's reserved really for his disciples. But it's secrets on how the kingdom of God operates and how you and I can tap into what really belongs to us. But you're going to have to apply yourself in order to do it, and that's kind of what we're looking at. So I'm just going to give you three keys to help you to understand how to receive <clears throat> what has been given. Because it says he's already done, he's already given. You know, at the beginning of a year, we always say, well, what kind of year are you going to have? Well, really, what kind of year you are going to have is up to you. It's not up to God, it's up to you. What kind of year are you going to have? God's already given. 
God's already done his part. This is a chess game and he already moved. It's your turn. It's your turn. If you do what you did in 2017, you'll have a year like 2017 or a little worse. Most things tend to deteriorate. I think that's the second law of thermodynamics. Everything tends to deteriorate. So, what kind of year are you going to have? I want you to have a great year, but that depends on you. So, I'm going to try to give you some tools this morning. We're going to talk about it a little bit, but I'm going to give you three keys to understanding how to receive what's already been given. Number one is this, hearing must be a priority. Everybody say it out loud. Hearing Hearing. must be a priority. Now, Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes. Belief, trust, confidence. And of course, Jesus said, If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. How do you you get faith? Faith comes, it says right here, by hearing. Very interesting if you, I know we have Bible school students here, but I mean, if you're just a, you don't have to be going to Bible school. If you're a student in the Bible, it's very interesting how much the Bible talks about hearing. In fact, one phrase that Jesus used, I looked it up last night, about 12 times in the Gospels, he said this phrase, and then a bunch of times he said something similar. He that hath ears to hear, let him let him hear. Now, he wasn't ta- everybody's got ears hanging on the side of their head. That's not what he's talking about. He that has ears to hear, you, you have to have a certain, a certain way. You have, there, there should be some things about that that he's talking about. So hearing must be a priority. Now, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus said, in Mark 4, 24, take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. Everybody say, what you hear. So, I mean, what what, what are you hearing? What, what, What did you listen to a whole lot in 2017? I mean, you you, you should be running this over in your mind. What, What did you hear? Because Jesus Christ, and he's pretty smart. How many remember Jesus? Yeah. He said, take heed or pay attention to what... You hear. Well, how come? Why you got to pay attention to what you hear? Well, faith comes by hearing God's word. Fear, doubt, unbelief, a wrong world view, wrong priorities, a messed up life, all of that comes from hearing other words. You know, words create images and pictures and desires, and you can listen to something. That's why you go to the movies, and they put all them pictures of popcorn and Cokes up there. And then they talk about how great it is for you to drink soda pop and have popcorn. And you're sitting there and you weren't even thinking about it. Next thing you know, you want a popcorn. Words and pictures create images that create desires in your life. Jesus said you better take heed what you hear. Because what you hear can cause unbelief or confusion or wrong believing or wrong priorities. What, what are you hearing? What do you hear? What did you hear in 2017? What did you hear? If you're not getting spiritually stronger, better at using your faith, better health, better finances, more joy, more peace, better at walking in the God kind of love, more self-control, then you need to adjust what you hear. What you hear is important. The difference between church attenders and disciples of Jesus is like the Grand Canyon. Huge difference. There are a lot of people that attend church. There are no more disciples of Jesus than you're the first man on Mars. They just go to church. Hopefully they'll make it to heaven. Hopefully they've been born again. They're not disciples of the Lord. How do you know? Well, Jesus told you what a disciple is. Over here in John chapter 8, remember what Jesus said about it? It has to do with hearing. He said, if, he's, he's talking to the Jews that believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What? If you do what? If you do what? 
continue in my word. What you hear. Do you continue in the word of God or are you listening to a bunch of other stuff? Now we live in an age that's unlike any age in the history of humanity. We got information coming to us constantly on your, on your phone now. You can listen, hear anything. You can get everybody's opinion. You can, you can listen to what they think about it and what they said and the world certainly has an opinion about everything. And 99% of the time it runs contrary to what God said. That's why Jesus said you better pay attention to what you hear because he said if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples. If you continue in my word, you're my disciples indeed. Then he says you'll know the truth and truth will make you free. Free from what? Whatever you need to be free from. Free from your addictions. Free from sins. Free from wrong behavior, wrong thinking. Free from your depression. Free from fear. Free from unbelief. Free from doubt. Free from sickness. Free from poverty. Wherever you need to be free, there's a way to be free. Jesus said you got to continue in his word. It brings freedom. That's why he said you better take heed. Take heed beats, pay attention. And Jesus knew what he was talking about pretty good. Take heed what you hear. You can't listen to, you know, uh, I, so Pastor, I ain't got time to be listening to, to you on the podcast or listening to good preaching or, or, you know, I just used to have a Bible and I'd just, I'd plug it in, just listen to Scripture over and over, New Testament over and over. I ain't got time for that. I'm too busy listening to, you can break my heart, my icky, breaky heart. Well, I, I'm sure that that might sound good, but I don't really believe it's going to do you a whole lot of good in your life. I'm too busy listening to Sports Center, and I want to know about all the sports. I may be good. I'm not against sports, but I really don't imagine that's going to do you a whole lot of good. Y'all quit shouting and sit down out there. I mean, there's a whole lot of things you can tune into, unlike any before. But you know what? Now you can also listen to the Word of God more than ever before. You can hear good teaching, good preaching that will build faith that'll renew your mind, that'll strengthen you, that'll cause you to go out and accomplish the will of God for your life more than ever before. Take heed what you hear. Everybody say, take heed what you hear. But then that's not all Jesus said about hearing. In Luke 8, 18, notice what he said here. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. What? Take heed, therefore, how you hear. How? Everybody say, how you hear. Now that's talking about uh, your attitude of hearing. A lot of people can hear, you you know, sometimes uh, I might be watching something on television or busy doing something and my wife is talking and I can hear, sort of. But sometimes I don't even hear. And I know, and and, then she'll get my attention and say, didn't you hear what I said? Uh, Just repeat it for my benefit. No, I didn't hear none of it. How come I was focused on something else? So Jesus said, take heed not only what you hear, but how you hear. You can sit in here and hear the Word of God taught, and it go in one ear and out the other, or you can just reject it and say, I don't believe that. Well, you won't be bothered with it then. But Jesus knew what he's talking about, so he said, take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. The receptiveness or the attitude. How hungry are you for the Word of God? I mean, some people would fight you over getting home to watch their favorite television show that they've been watching. They're not going to miss that. They get their whole schedule around when they can get home and they can see as the stomach turns or, or Die Nasty or one of these other shows that's out there. Dynasty, Die, die Nasty. Anyway. <clears throat> And I mean, they get their whole schedule all around that because they ain't going to miss that. Are you hungry for the Word of God? Does it matter to you or not? Does it matter? The Bible tells you kind of the attitude you ought to have about how you hear over in Proverbs chapter 2. Now, you could read the whole, you could read all of Proverbs. It, it, it talks about hearing all the time, but I'm just going to give you a few verses. Proverbs 2, my son, if you will receive my words, and hide my commandments with thee so that you incline your ear unto wisdom 
and apply your heart. How many of you ever applied yourself to something? Apply your heart to understanding. If you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hid treasures, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the what? And how do you get what belongs to you? Through, through knowledge. But you have to have this kind of attitude Jesus talked about, about how you hear. And you've got to, you I mean, if you had a bunch of treasure, if you knew there was a treasure that had been lost or your great-grandfather buried out there on his property and it's worth, you know, a lot of money. There's millions of dollars worth of gold coins and silver and jewels. And it's there. you'd apply yourself to getting it. You'd be searching for it. Well, he said that's the kind of attitude you got to have about God's word. If it don't matter to you, then you're not. You're, you're, 2018 ain't changing no more in 2017 or 16. Or, your life will just keep the way it is, and you can hold on and go to heaven when you die, and get there, and you can survive. Probably make it all right. But if you want to change, if you want to have what's been given, if you want to reach the new level. If you want to accomplish more and have a better life and be more prosperous and more healthy and more happy and do more for the kingdom of God, you're going to have to do something about what you hear and how you hear. Can I get an amen from you? Hearing is important. Hearing is important. It is a priority. Second thing you got to know, we're talking about how do you tap into what has been given? Faith receives what grace has provided. Everybody say that out loud. Faith receives what grace has provided. Now, some people get a little screwed up when it comes to faith, and, and they sort of have this idea, and, I, and I'm not mad at them. They just kind of get a little over here in the ditch, and they act like their faith moves God to do something. Uh, that's not true. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your faith ain't moving God to do anything. If God hadn't already moved, your faith ain't doing nothing about it. Faith receives what's already been provided, what grace has provided. That's what faith does. Now, in Ephesians 1, notice what it says here in Ephesians 1, 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Notice it says hath blessed us. Half blessed us. Everybody say it out loud. Half blessed us. With what? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now that's King James. That was written a long time ago. <clears throat> I got another translation that's a little more up to date than Orly translation. Notice what it says. Who has blessed us, who has blessed, that, that's not right. They, they, didn't, they left out some words. Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, heaven itself enjoys. What? Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, heaven itself enjoys. Who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing, heaven itself enjoys. Well, I mean, heaven's got it going on, don't it? He has blessed us. Faith doesn't make God do anything. Faith just believes and receives what God has done. That's all faith does. It's just confidence in God and His Word. You just have to treat God like He's telling the truth and He's not a liar. That's all faith does. Faith just says, I believe what you said there. I believe that. I receive that. That's truth. For instance, when it comes to salvation... I mean, you remember John, 1 John 2, the whole whole thing's good, but the whole first chapter's good, and it's talking about what, you know, Jesus, and he's our priest, and so on and so forth. But 1 John 2, verse 2 says, and he, that same Jesus, is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours alone, but also for the sins of the whole world. How many of you believe that? How many believe that? Not a trick question. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not ours only. He was the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Whole world. How come the whole world ain't saved then? 
Well, as far as God's concerned, they are. Jesus ain't dying no more. There ain't going to be no more sacrifice made, sacrifice already made. But you and I have to see what's provided. Grace provided that. Grace sent Jesus Christ for you as ever born to save you. Grace did that. Mercy did that for you. But you have to believe it. You have to put faith in what that says right there. And then that, your faith in what's already been provided causes you to receive it. For instance, salvation, that's what we're talking about. Notice what it says in Ephesians 2, verse 8. It puts it right together for you. Can't miss this. For by grace are you saved. Grace is what God provided that you didn't deserve. It's already been provided. He hath given. One of the things he's given is eternal life or salvation. For by grace are you saved, but how do you get it? Through what? Through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace provided that for you. Faith came to you when you heard about it, so you got to hear about it. Faith comes by hearing. And then you can decide whether you believe it or whether you don't. And there's a lot of people, they hear it and they say, that's nonsense. I know, I've talked to them. I mean, I talked to a guy on his deathbed. I would normally never do it. His family begged me, please go see him. He's about to die. Doctor says he's just got a few days to live. Go talk to him. Talk to him about Jesus. Said he died. Atone. His blood sacrifice atoned for your sins. You can be saved. He said, I don't believe any of that nonsense. I said, all right, have a good day. I mean, it was provided, but he didn't believe it. Grace provided it, for by grace, he, that man was saved by grace. But he didn't receive it. He didn't put any faith in it. And it takes that combination. What God has done, and then you have to believe what God's done. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, that not yourself, it's a gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast. Can I get an amen from you? Amen. So, <clears throat> grace provided stuff. Now, what all has grace provided? Well, I mean, we don't have time to, I mean, whole New Testament. You need to read the New Testament, but... What about healing? Has healing been provided? Well, the Bible says it does. Notice what Peter said about this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He personally bore our sins. This is Simon Peter talking. He personally, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, his own altar, and he offered himself on it, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Righteousness just is an old English word that means to be in right standing with God. Then it says, by his wounds, you have been healed. Grace provided that. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You weren't good enough to be healed any more than you were good enough to be saved. But it says, by his wounds, you have been healed. Now, what, what faith does is say, I believe what that says, Father, and I thank you and I praise you for it. You know, it's a waste of time for you to be asking God to do something he's already done. Ain't no use asking God to save you. He already did that. He wants you to believe that he did save you by sending his son Jesus and his blood sacrifice. You've got to believe you were healed before you feel like it. That's how you tap into what grace is provided by your faith, by your faith saying, I believe what you did. I believe he was wounded. I believe there's holes in his hands that you can see light through. I believe there's holes in his feet that you can see where those spikes went through his feet. I believe there's a spear hole in his side where the spear went up into his blood, into the sack around his heart and pierced it and water and blood flowed out and there's a hole in his side. And I believe by his wounds we have been healed as far as God's concerned. He ain't going to do nothing else about healing you. As far as he's concerned, it's done. And your faith reaches out and says, Father, I thank you and praise you according to your word here, sir. I've been healed by the wounds of Jesus, and I praise you, and I thank you, and I worship you for it. By his wounds, I was healed. That's how faith taps into what grace has provided. What about finances? Does he do anything about your finances, or you just kind of got to scrape and get by the best way you can? Well, the Bible says he did something about your money. 2 Corinthians 8 9. 
Now, this was written about a church. They were sending an offering in and all of that stuff. And so he was talking, a whole chapter, he's talking about money. Then he gets here to verse 9. <clears throat> you are becoming progressively acquainted with and recognizing more strongly and clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we all need to understand his grace more. His kindness, his gracious generosity. Everybody say generosity. How many of you believe God's generous? How many of you are generous? Well, he's more generous than you are, isn't he? I mean, Jesus said he was. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Ain't that what Jesus said about it? He said, I want you to know his kindness, his gracious generosity, his undeserved favor. He said, Pastor, I don't deserve it. I know it. Neither do I. Neither is anybody else. And spiritual blessing in that though he was so very rich and uh, Jesus was doing all right before he came down here. He was so very rich, yet for your sakes he became so very poor in order that by his poverty you might become enriched, abundantly supplied. And you have ding-dong saying, well, I, I just don't believe God wants Christians to have anything. Well, then you won't be bothered about it because it's by faith that you tap into what grace has provided. Besides that, you're a hypocrite. You don't believe that anyway, blabber mouth. You're just shooting your mouth off. If God don't want you to have nothing, why do you get up and go to work and try to make more money so you can buy more stuff? If it's not the will of God for you to prosper, why do you keep trying to get a raise at work? Why do you want a better life for your children if God don't want you to have nothing? You don't believe that nonsense. It's like somebody saying, well, I don't believe, I don't believe God wants people to be healed today. Well, then quit going to the doctor and taking medicine, you hypocrite. Just stay sick and die. Why do you want to go to the doctor to try to get yourself out of the will of God if it ain't God's will for you to be well? Y'all quit shouting and sit down out there. No, you and I both know God wants you to prosper just like you want your children to prosper. And he paid a price for it. He was cursed in your place to redeem you from the curse. And go back and read it in Deuteronomy 28. Part of the curse was poverty. Don't tell me it's a blessing. I'm too old. I've been too far and seen too much. I've seen starving children. I've seen people dying because they didn't have anything to eat. Don't tell me poverty is a blessing and does something good for you spiritually. It destroys your life and your family. God's the God of blessing. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be a blessing to the world around you because he loves you. Yeah, he did something about it. He became poor so you through his poverty might be rich, abundantly supplied so you can be a blessing to the world around you. That's what he told Abraham. I'll bless you and make you a blessing. So everybody could see, well, man, what kind of God? Do you understand all the people in Abraham's day were idol worshipers? They worshiped everything under the sun. God said, I'm make a covenant with this man here. I'm going to show I'm the almighty God. And everybody's going to see my goodness and you're going to be, I'm going to bless you and you're going to be a blessing to everybody. And they're going to say, who's that God you serve? That's a God I want. I want that God there. It's still supposed to be the way that it is. That's why he has given us everything pertains to life and godliness, made you a child of God, an heir of God, and a joint heir with Christ. He hath provided it. But you've got to believe what he's done and then tap into it by your believing, by your faith. Can I get an amen? Got to quit on that. Third thing, last thing. Some things take time and consistency to develop. Just because you start believing what God said today, maybe your body is sick. Well, by his wounds you were healed. But some things take time. The Bible says the kingdom of God operates like seed being planted. In Mark chapter 4, notice what Jesus said about this. 
so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed spring and grow up. He don't know how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. You'll eventually get your harvest if you plant the seed of God's word, what you hear and how you hear, and you water it by your praise and your thanksgiving and speaking and saying, God, I praise you and thank you for your word. I praise you for what you said. By his wounds I was healed. I give you glory and praise for it. You're watering the seed. He said, whole kingdom of God's like that. And sometimes then as you begin to water it, when harvest time starts coming, if you're a spirit-filled believer, now if you're not, you need to be. Someone said, I don't believe in all that speaking in tongues. Well, you're messed up then. You're missing out on something really good. He sent the Holy Spirit to be your comforter and your helper. You'd receive power from on high when you receive the mighty infilling of the Holy Spirit. But anyway, if you're a believer who is, and we have a lot of them here filled with the Spirit, when you pray in the Spirit, a lot of times He'll begin to show you then, all right, it's harvest time, here's how you get it. Do this. Make this change. Do this one thing. He'll reveal things to you. Now, I remember, for instance, Veld and I, we lived over on uh, Sendero, over here by uh, McDonald's, on the other side of McDonald's, Sendero Drive. Well, we decided we wanted to sell that house that we lived in, and so we agreed, and, and <clears throat> we started, you know, about prayer. Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Just use my name. So we grabbed hands and prayed in the name of Jesus, said, Father, we, we believe right now we're asking you to send the buyer to get this house. We call this house sold. We're asking you to do it. Send the buyer now in the name of Jesus. We believed that the house was sold, and so we just went on started praising God. Every time I'd drive up the driveway, I'd say, thank God the house is sold. Well, then I was praying in the Spirit, which I regularly do, and I'm praying in unknown languages. Somebody said, why in the world would you want to pray in unknown languages? Unknown tongues. That's crazy. Well, I ain't talking to you. I'm praying out of my spirit to God Almighty. The Bible says my spirit, by the help of the Holy Spirit within me, prays when I'm doing that. So I'm praying in, in the spirit and just worshiping the Lord and praying in tongues. And all of a sudden on the inside of me, I, wasn't, I didn't even know I was talking about this to God or praying. I'm just praising the Lord. Thank you, Lord. How's the soul? And I get this just kind of bubbles up on the inside of my mind. Uh, don't use realtor. <clears throat> now, I'm not against using realtors. I've used them since that and will probably use them again. But that wasn't the way he wanted me to harvest this time. He said, go out and take a pretty good-sized picture of your house, put it over in the real estate section yourself. I said, okay. So I just went out, took a picture of my house, stood out in the street, took a picture, and I got about a... I don't know, an eighth page ad and put it right in the real estate, house for sale, here's the picture, here's the price for sale by owner. And I mean, I sold it in about a week. Just like that. That's how, that's how he told me to harvest. Now, he may give you another idea how to harvest whatever it is you need. In your business, he may give you one idea, one idea that changes everything, gives you one idea. Why? Because he's a God. He's got plenty of ideas. He's got plenty of wisdom. He knows everything. He told Peter right where to get the fish. He said, go out in the deep water out there. Peter said, we fished all night, didn't catch anything. I imagine Jesus just looked at him like, what did I say? I said, go out in the deep and throw out your nets. He said, all right, at your word, I'll do it. What happened? He got a boatload, and his partners all got a boatload. Says they were astonished at the catch. God knows still how to astonish you. If you'll believe him, he hath given everything pertains to life and godliness, and your faith in what he's provided will cause some astonishing results in your life. So what do you got to do about it? Hearing has to be a priority. What are you going to listen to this year more? Rock and roll music. Well, that probably ain't going to help you. 
just being honest about why well, I just want to watch more television. Well, good, just go for it, baby. Because he said, you better take heed what you hear and you better take heed how you hear, what's important to you. So if you want to have a better year and a better life, really it's up to you. As for me, I'm going higher. Going higher. Stronger. More prosperous. More healthy. More blessed. More peace. More joy. More self-control. You know, my wife told me over the holidays, she said, uh, you kind of need to watch all the desserts you've been eating. So, so I've been kind of watching, and boy, I tell you, it was something to see. <clears throat> <laughs> now, if you want things to be better, you change. Can I get an amen from you? Amen. What are you hearing? How are you hearing? Faith reaches out and taps into what grace has provided, and then some things take time. And you just plant that seed of God's Word and keep watering in it, by your speaking and your praising. And Jesus said that's the way the kingdom operates. It'll grow up and you'll get your harvest. Can I get an amen from you?